The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Mara Du. I teach the history of Qing and Republican China at the Department of History here at Cornell. I'm serving as director of the CCCI series in spring 2023 with the theme in general China. Founded in 2015, this lecture series has brought hundreds of leading scholars on China from various disciplinary backgrounds to share their cutting edge research with Cornell students, faculty, and the general public. This th series is sponsored by the East Asia program. Here, I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the co-sponsors of this series in spring 2023. The Department of Asian Studies, Cornell Center for Social Sciences, the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program, the Department of History, ILR Schools Global Labor Institute, the Levinson China and Asia Pacific Studies Program, and Cornell Society for the Humanities. Since spring 2022, the CCCI series has been held both in person on campus and broadcasted online via Zoom. To those who are attending this lecture via Zoom today, please type in your questions and comments into the chat box anytime during the lecture and during the Q&A. We will cover them during our Q&A session with the speaker following the lecture. The recording of this lecture will be made available online after the talk. Please feel free to share it to your colleagues, classmates, and friends if they cannot make it today due to schedule conflict. It is an honor for me to introduce our speaker today. Professor Iga Dong is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and in the Department of Global Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University at Buffalo, State University of New York. She received her PhD from John Hopkins University in 2019. Professor Dong is a recipient of many prestigious fellowships, including the Woodrow Wilson National Dissertation Fellowship in Women's Studies and the Henry Luce Early Career Fellowship in China Studies at the American Council of Learned Societies. She is the author of numerous peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters on gender and work, labor politics, and the social reproduction, past and present. Today, she is going to give a lecture on part of her forthcoming book titled The Fabric of Care, Women's Work and the Politics of Livelihood in Industrial China, 1920 to 2020. Now, let's welcome Professor Dong with warm applause. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Du, for your very elaborate and generous introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming to uh, my talk. Uh, we are competing with such a nice weather and a lot of events. I know this is the final week at Cornell. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Amala Lin for her, all her work that made my uh, visit uh, very pleasant. And also the uh, wonderful grad students here, uh, Meng Zhong, Anke, and uh, Kun, uh, for making my uh, trip even more <laughs> pleasant and uh, relaxing, actually. Uh, so uh, today, um, the talk, uh, uh, the, uh, the title of my talk um, is, uh, as you've seen, The Fiber of Care, Women's Work and the Politics of Livelihood in Socialist China. Uh, I'm a sociologist by training, but my work lies at the intersection of history, sociology, and gender studies. And uh, uh, th this is a chapter derived from the book I'm working on. And uh, uh, the book is about uh, the story of the book is a century long uh, story of how uh, po the politics of care work has transformed while China uh, has been industrializing. Uh, and today's talk will focus on the heyday of state socialism in the early 1950s and the 60s, um, and especially focus on a particular group of people that I will explain just in a moment. And uh, let's start with a figure I encountered in the year 2016 when I was doing field work in Zhengzhou, the capital city of Henan province. Um, so, just a second. Okay, so uh, to the right, the, this is uh, to the left, this is a figure I took, um, uh, a picture I took when I was interviewing uh, this um, 
old late uh, lady in her nineties. Her name was Han Hui Lan. Um, uh, she joined the underground communist party in Shanghai uh, in the nineteen forties when she was only fifteen. And after the party took over the country, she rose quickly uh, and became the deputy head of Putuo District uh, in Shanghai in nineteen fifty six. Uh, the only female uh, who's at that rank in the entire city. And uh, uh, she re relocated to Zhengzhou in the year 58, and um, uh, she, uh, she became the first the head of the number one textile mill, and uh, as one of the only two female cadres uh, in Zhengzhou's entire history, her name was brought up many times by the local people. Her prominence in the bureaucratic system and her suffering during the Cultural Revolution has made Han Huilan a very much unforgettable figure in the local collective memory. And as you can see, this is a picture I found um, in the New Women of, of China, the magazine, uh, featuring Han Huilan representing uh, Chinese workers uh, attending a, a meeting uh, in Moscow in the year 1950. And uh, this is another picture uh, featuring Hang and her family with her husband and their lovely uh, child. So after hearing many of her professional achievements, um, when I finally had the privilege to interview Hang Huilan, uh, I asked her whether she had to balance work and life while serving as a factory head six decades ago. I know like, this is a question many high achieving women would get, uh, but uh, because I was primarily interested in care work, so I had to ask this question, despite uh, the, the your kind of, kind of the resentment. Um, Han Huilan then shared the following. Uh, Many women ca comrades had heavy family burden, but I didn't because I had the mother Shen or Shen Ma who would help out. I was struck uh, to hear the existence of Shen Ma at first as it had never been mentioned by anyone I encountered who would otherwise say a lot about Han Huilan. Neither did the official representations that you have seen uh, seem to be interested in this aspect of Han's life. Uh, since Mother Shen has passed, had passed away many years ago, I could only reconstruct her story through Han's account. Um, she told me that Mother Shen, whose maiden name I cannot recall now, married my husband's brother and had lived in Jiangsu in the late 1950s when my husband's brother died and left behind his wife and two young children. The three of them came to Zhengzhou and seek refuge with my family. In the beginning, Mother Shen was a jiaxu, living with us, helping me cook, taking care of my two children and my sick parents-in-law in addition to her own children. That's why I never cooked. And later in the 70s, uh, the neighborhood community started running small factories, and she went to work in one of those to earn a wage. She said, everyone has two hands, and I shouldn't be eating free meals at home. A few years later, when her daughter found a job as a school teacher, Mother Shen and her children moved out. After she left, I didn't know how to do housework, so I started hiring a paid nanny. So Mother Shen's identity here is a paradox. On the one hand, she's identified by Han as a jia shu, a Chinese term that refers to one's family members, including parents, uh, spouses, children, siblings, and so on and so forth, but primarily spouses, female spouse um, in the Mao era. On the other hand, adding ma, or literally mother in Chinese, after the surname was the standard way to address a female domestic maid in pre-revolutionary China. Calling her sister-in-law Mother Shen reveals how Han Huilan understood the social and economic relationship between the two of them by doing all the domestic work in exchange for her and her two children's subsistence. Shen Ma essentially worked as a maid in Han's household. Shen Ma also seemed to think of herself more as a maid than a family member. That's why when there was an opportunity to get a paid job, she did not hesitate uh, to leave because she believed that she had been quote unquote eating free meals at home. The tension between the label Jia Shu assigned to Shen Ma and all the work she did is quite telling. It reveals that while the term discursively implies one's dependency on others, 
the person so labeled was actually anything but simply a dependent. Despite the fact that Jia Shu constituted the official discourse in Maoyer China and featured in personal memories about the socialist past, this group of people have remained obscure, oftentimes escaping scholarly scrutinization. So the rest of the talk will tell the hidden story of Jia Shu in the early years of the PRC. This is in huge contrast with the most popularly circulated super simple symbols of female in the Mao era that we are more familiar with, uh, such as the Aaron girls um, and the model workers. Uh, this is actually the, the picture uh, on the right uh, is a cover of the uh, uh, a book called the History of Textile Workers. It's about, uh, you know, uh, textile workers uh, from all of the globe, and they picked right uh, a Chinese textile worker from the Mao era uh, as the cover. So it's such an epitome, right, of women's participation in production. So this is really in huge contrast with the hidden um, image of the uh, Jia Shu. And uh, in some circumstances, uh, Jia Shu was were denounced uh, as the parasite of socialism. Uh, in others, they were applauded as the rear guard of socialism. Most of the time, they stayed at home serving other family members who had a paid job, being overshadowed by other women working in the public domain. However, at the height of the Great Leap Forward, they took part in mass production and collectivized the social services in the urban people's communes, staring one of the most radical social experiments in human history. My analysis is first and foremost a empirical sketch of the uh, tumultuous trajectories of Jia Shu crossing different social spaces during the first decade of the PRC. Furthermore, more, by illustrating um, the perceived domesticity and the um, dependency of Jia Shu on the one hand and their diverse activities inside and outside the household uh, I join and deepen the ongoing conversation between feminist political economy and the critical studies of historically lived socialism. My, um, this is a picture uh, uh, showing Jia Shu doing uh, their supportive work in one of the textile mills uh, from uh, the magazine uh, of the textile workers of China, Zhongguo Fangzhi Gongren, in 1953. And to summarize, uh, to give you a preview of my argument, um, Women's work, as embodied in the case of Jia Shu, was not only central to the formation of the socialist regime of accumulation, but the unnerving struggles around this socially constructed terrain have also effectively derailed the Great Leap. That's my bold argument, one of the most ambitious projects in Mao's reign. To be sure, I'm not the first one studying Jia Shu. Uh, actually, I'm very much indebted to historians uh, like Song Xiaopeng and Wang Zheng, who pioneered in studying Jia Shu in relation to the PRC politics. Challenging historian Gail Hershatter's notion that the domestic was totally separated from the public and neglected by the party state, Song Xiaopeng argues that instead of neglecting the domestic, the party state, in fact, took efforts to theorize and transform the domestic sphere, making the domestic an integral part of the public. But on the other hand, the state made urban Jashu a distinct political constitute, reckoning the importance of their labor in building socialism, uh, while intentionally kept the boundary between the public and the domestic, and never challenged the gender division of labor within and across the two spheres. To a large extent, Jia Shu's domestic labor was deemed to be their natural duty rather than generating any form of economic value. Song Xiaopeng concludes that by appropriating Jia Shu's free labor, the state was able to keep both workers' wages and welfare redistribution low while reinvesting most of its profits in industrial production. But the preservation of women's domesticity and the undervaluation of their reproductive work by the state was not simply what the regime of accumulation needs. So it's ju not just a functionalist uh, view from the, uh, here. Uh, Wang Zheng unpacks the seemingly monolithic socialist state, analyzed the political struggle between Chinese feminism within the party and the male party leaders. She reveals that the naturalization 
of Jiaxu's domesticity was a result of the state's feminist survival strategy during the anti-righteous campaign in 57, in which their institutional establishments, that is the All China Women's Federation, Quan uh, Bo was on the brink of being abolished. That's the fate of their Soviet counterpart. The women's department uh, was liquidated uh, right after the establishment of the Soviet regime. But somehow the Chinese Women's Federation managed to survive. In light of both perspectives above, that is the analysis of political economy and the historical agency, uh, my study turns to the convoluted relationship between Joshua's lived experience and the turbulent unfolding of the accumulation strategies between 1949 and the aftermath of the Great Leap. Um, and here I want to just uh, uh, introduce two concepts, uh, which is something I've been engaging a lot, but just in case some of you in the audience are not familiar, but I believe it nowadays is quite a familiar term to many of you, uh, I will uh, use uh, employ these two terms um, uh, throughout my talk, uh, uh, by mentioning social reproduction, uh, I mean uh, human activities and social institutions uh, that sustain the daily and the generational renewal of human beings and our society. And uh, by saying reproductive labor, I mean um, a wide range of biological, physical, and emotional work ranging from childbirthing, preparing meals to nursing, um, uh, to uh, carrying the ill, the elderly, and the disabled. So basically, Joshua's work uh, at some point um, uh, is predominantly uh, reproductive labor, but not always, as I will show you in a moment. And um, But shifting uh, the focus uh, from national-level discourses and major metropolitans, my study draws on the local case of Zhengzhou, which is the world's largest iPhone manufacturing hub today, but was a young cotton mill town at the dawn of the Mao era. Uh, I can talk more about this case and my method and data during the Q&A, but let's just have a very quick uh, overview of this case. Uh, here I'm only presenting you one picture. This is the contrast between the two uh, periods. Uh, to the left is Chairman Mao visiting one of the Zhengzhou mills in 1960, and to the right is uh, Apple's CEO Tim Cook visiting uh, the same region in for 2014. Uh, so I'm tracing the transformation of this mill town and how it transformed into an iPhone city uh, as the background of my analysis. And uh, again, the rest of the talk will focus just on the uh, Mao era. And uh, so the, uh, I will divide uh, my analysis into roughly three periods. Um, the, uh, early 50s uh, until uh, the Great Leap, and then the Great Leap forward, and finally the re retrenchment right after the Great Leap. So first, let's focus on the first period uh, before the Great Leap. Um, and uh, so here is a list of vocabularies that I'm going to mention uh, so to help you to uh, understand. I gave you this uh, visual aid. Um, so in January uh, 1962, Wang Yuxi, the head of the Women's Department of Zhengzhou Trade Union, gave a speech at a meeting, uh, and uh, she told, um, this meeting is basically for the Jashu, and she told the Jashu that, as a Jashu, you must uh, strive um, to be right, diligent, dexterous, and frugal, so hong xin xiao jian, um, so that you can become a right housekeeper, hong se guan jia ren. And uh, this is a way uh, she wants to encourage the Jashu to diligently, frugally build the country and diligently, frugally manage the family. Xin jian chi jia and the xin jian jian guo, also known as liang qin. Uh, and you can see a poster that I found in 1961, where um, to the right they said hong qin qiao jian, so meaning that this is a kind of a popular idea, at least um, a kind of a prescriptive text that the party tried to uh, convey to the masses uh, in the early 60s. Um, so compared to the CCP, uh, the, uh, the party and the Women's Federation's agenda of mobilizing women to participate in production um, as a means to achieve uh, women's liberation, um, 
The emphasis on women's domesticity is quite puzzling at first um, glance. According to Wang Zhong, this conservative term that uh, is, can be dated back to 1957, it was a strategic move that uh, the state feminist made to protect themselves from being abolished by the male dominated power among the top party officials. Again, right, uh, they were regarded as being sometimes too radical uh, in terms of liberating women. And so uh, some male party, party leaders were not really satisfied with the feminists within the party and they want to uh, just abolish the women's federation uh, and uh, to self rescue, right? Uh, women's, uh, the Women's Federation, the feminists uh, stepped back by saying, actually, uh, we're happy to just serve as a supplement, uh, supporting girl as Jashu, right, as a domestic um, uh, figure. Uh, we don't want to step uh, on your feet, um, something like that. But um, Wang Zheng, again, argued that this term happened in 1957. But uh, in my research, I find that the Women's Federation shifted from organizing women workers um, to organizing Jashu long before 1957. And through this process, Jashu's initial position also became kind of fixed in the domestic sphere. Uh, when the CCP first took over the cities in the late 40s, most of the urban women were not uh, proletarian workers who would easily fit into this revolutionary imaginary. Rather, the, uh, the demographic composition of urban women was much complicated, including handicraft women, peddlers, sex workers, intellectuals, laborers in service sectors, and family members of the old capitalist and bourgeois professionals. As 1953, uh, among all the uh, urban female population, only 60% of them were employed in those state-run enterprises. So the vast majority of them, right, did not have a state job uh, or in the production sectors. They were, uh, again, all those sorts of different, uh, uh, playing all those different roles, as I mentioned, like uh, handicraft women, peddlers, so on and so forth. So, uh, so in a barely industrialized cities, like Zhengzhou, the majority, of course, of women were poor um, uh, women, uh, the poor manual laborers and the refugees from um, the neighboring uh, counties. According to the Zhengzhou's, Zhengzhou Women's Federation, almost all women then were poor working women, that's the uh, category they assigned to them, who had fled war and the famine and settled in Zhengzhou by marrying peddlers uh, rickshaw pullers and other types of manual laborers. Facing a devastated economy with a high employment rate and complex class composition, the Zhengzhou Women's Federation believed that their central task should be organizing the jiaxu of the poor labor, uh, manual laborers um, to self-rescue by participating in production. Again, the emphasis here is to join the, the productive public sphere uh, to shengchan zijiu. The Women's Federation brought unemployed women together and established workshops for shoemaking, hand spinning of linen, sewing, and washing clothes in exchange for cash income. Right, so they organized these women and they uh, organized them so they can work together in exchange for economic rewards. However, by the mid 1950s the reach of the Women's Federation shrunk to the sphere of reproduction only. Uh, the, now the Zhengzhou Women's Federation believes that their central task um, should be organizing the jiaxu. Uh, uh, so, so, oh here, so anyway, so uh, after that initial period in the early 50s, um, this quickly changed, so the Zhengzhou Women's Federation shrunk to the sphere of reproduction uh, because the landscape of labor force in Zhengzhou changed drastically. Between 1953 and 58, uh, six modern textile mills and a series of supporting enterprises went into production one after another. Tens of thousands of spinners and weavers, as well as technicians and padres, came to and settled in Zhengzhou, and the majority of them were women aged between 18 and 25. As newcomers to Zhengzhou 
uh, most of um, most workers settled in the living compounds next to the factory, and each of the factory became a gangwei, as you all uh, are familiar with. Uh, as a nationwide mode of organizing and controlling labor, uh, Danwei offered an elaborate range of welfare provisions, including health care, housing, uh, so on and so forth. And this is a uh, birth uh, view of the textile mill zone in Zhengzhou. Uh, in the 60s. So as a socialist industrial city is in the making, the seemingly petty forms of production, such as handicraft, would soon be diminished. Uh, the category, category of poor working women, also diminished in official discourse of the local federation, the women's federation. It was against this backdrop that Jiashu emerged, the category Jiashu emerged as a major category referring to unemployed family members uh, in the Stanway system. Although many older, less educated women would continue making shoes, sewing, tailoring, and washing clothes to bring home extra income, they were not considered working women anymore. Instead, now they were ultimately, finally, categorized as jiashu, as if they're not making any economic contribution to the family. In the year 1956, the Women's Federation, the National uh, Women's Federation, launched the Five Virtues Campaign, Wu Hao, to help frontline workers achieve the production goals of the five, first five years plan. It called on Jiaxu to manage the home uh, thriftily, build so solidarity with and among families, provide good education to children, take good care of hygiene and sanitation, and uh, attend literacy uh, classes. So all are in the kind of the social reproduction sphere now. In the textile industry, since most single women or young mothers were employed on the front line, Jiaxu were usually older women who migrated with their children to, who come from the countryside and now join their children or husband uh, in the city. Besides cooking and taking care of the grandchildren, many of them joined the sewing and the laundry groups. After 1956, when more peasants flooded into the city to live with their children or relatives, unions in industrial enterprises began organizing jiashu to grow sideline plots, raise pigs, and produce basic goods around the Danwei compound. Jiashu were also the key labor resource for maintaining public hygiene and greening the environment. For example, in 56, citywide in Zhengzhou, Jiashu were recruited to kill the four pests, Chu Si Hai, and to plant trees and flowers in their neighborhood. And this is a picture uh, showing uh, Jiashu were uh, talking about how to uh, kill uh, mice uh, in the Beijing neighborhood. Between 49 and 1957, most of the work done by Jiashu was not considered to be production and thus was compensated in a very modest way, if at all. During this period, few women older than 40 could find a regular paying job. Uh, all the paying nice state jobs are taken by the younger um, generation. Uh, for, th for the older women, working in the state-run taxa meal and earning a relatively high wage was a luxury that only their much younger and better educated uh, counterparts could join. However, the Great Leap Forward in the summer of 58 and the following urban women, uh, urban people's coming movement profoundly reconfigured Jashu's positions um, in this story. So, to, as we all know, to, spe to speed up industrial accumulation, Mao announced in Moscow in November 1957 that the new development approach would adopt a radical model to accelerate accumulation by, by further collectivizing production, intensifying labor, and minimalizing redistribution. This approach abandoned central rationing and required local governments and enterprises to become self-reliant. So the central government is not giving you anything, but you have to rely on yourself. At the same time, you have to speed up in terms of production. The People's Coming was an instru institutional innovation to develop um, that developed primarily in rural areas, as we all know, uh, but to a lesser extent, it's also developed in cities, uh, which is to uh, try to combine production and the social reproduction, and to collectivize the social reproduction so that the state would not need to spend any money on welfare provisions, right? If you self-organize social reproduction, then you don't need the state to pay you anything um, for that. 
So it was in this historical context that the Communist Party's zeal in mobilizing Jiaxu to enter the public space uh, culminated. To the top leaders, mobilizing women to join the Great Leap consists of two components. First, a significant portion of young women who had already been working outside the home should substitute for their male counterparts who, would, who now uh, would um, to take uh, some uh, new industrial and construction projects. Uh, so basically to replace um, a man with uh, women who are already working out at the home. So men can do something uh, other project, right? And the second uh, avenue is uh, to mobilize Jiaxu, who had never been had formal jobs uh, before, but made up the majority of the urban women's population to mobilize these women. And their task now is to join production or collectivize social reproduction. Uh, while a s small um, portion of the Jiaxu would work in state-run enterprises, this is a picture I found. Uh, 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 this is a picture, a historical um, image from one of the Zhengzhou urban people's commune, uh, where younger, relatively young Jiaxu joined uh, production. Uh, the majority of the Jiaxu uh, now would actually uh, join the collectivized social reproduction, as this picture show uh, again uh, from the same commune uh, historical picture as. You see, uh, the Jashu are now uh, serving the daycare centers uh, in those uh, communes. And uh, at the beginning of the Great Leap, the party's top leaders proposed one of the most radical plans for collectivizing reproductive labor. In a lengthy speech delivered at the Women's Federation on June 14, 1958, Liu Shaoqi, the then vice chairman of the party, spoke of the relationship between liberating women's labor and advancing production. And he said, uh, we liberate women from domestic chores not because we're doing women a favor. Instead, this is for overall production, social progress, and achieving communism, all of which require women to be liberated from domestic labor. Thus, I'm proposing this solution to build as many care centers, public canteens, and public services as we can, while the primary goal is to organize production. production. Can we also organize urban Jiaxu and rural women to transform our daily life and services? Liu Shaoqi suggests that Jiaxu collectivize cooking, laundry, tailoring, shoemaking, and childcare. To Liu Shaoqi, the sphere of social reproduction could be subjugated to the same logic of mass production. So that he said that collective service is not merely consumption, it's also about production. Cooking can be regarded as a form of production, it's food production or food industry. Clothing repair is like machinery repair. Haircut is a kind of a repair. Uh, it's in a nutshell, these are all socially necessary. And Liu Shaoqi actually also mentioned that uh, when he was young, uh, he saw, uh, I think it's from some Japanese translation, he actually got the inspiration from Robert Owen, who had those kind of utopian communes uh, in this uh, country. And he draws, uh, Liu Shaoqi drew some ideas from that too. Uh, in the same month when Liu Shaoqi gave this speech, uh, Zhengzhou saw the development um, of the Red Flag Commune, the first of its kind nationwide. So the very first the urban people's commune actually started from Zhengzhou. Um, following Red Flag, in August, another prominent commune was established that combined the Zhengzhou, Zhengzhou textile machinery factory and several ne nearby neighborhoods. These earliest movements despite their appearances in local newspapers and internal circulations within the party, was not publicized nationwide until two years later in 1960. That's very interesting. It was in, actually in the spring of 1960 when Mao and his allies attempt to provide a second push to keep the Great Leap Forward going despite the similar crisis that the urban people's communal movement became a national movement. It was also in this year that the five textile mills in Zhengzhou uh, formed one meta commune, which is called the Textile People, People's Commune, Fangzhi Renmin Gongshe, which was actually short-lived and was actually never um, voluntarily brought up by any of my informants. Uh, and in Zhengzhou, according to the local women's federation, uh, 
citywide, there are about more than 60,000 people uh, who were liberated from the home, and 82% of them were Jiashu, female spouses of uh, other kind of workers. Among these Jiashu, about 14,000 got jobs in state-run industrial enterprises or its affiliate uh, sectors, and about two-thirds who uh, were asked to self-organize uh, into uh, kind of commune-based um, industrial workshops and welfare services. To Jashu, working in the state-run enterprises at this time, even though just as contract, contract workers, not permanent workers, um, was still much better and more desirable than joining the collective workshops and the service sectors uh, that, that were self-organized uh, by the commune. So basically, the logic is very you know, obvious. Uh, anything related uh, to the state is stable, with more prestigious, better benefits, and um, so on and so forth. Um, and in Zhengzhou textile machinery commune, which I will call Zhengfangji commune in the rest of the talk, there were about uh, 1,400 jiashu uh, between the age uh, of 20 and 50. And the vast majority of them were uh, uh, illiterate, while about a quarter of them worked in the state sector. Most of them uh, would typically work um, um, in the commune uh, as a service, a uh, kind of informal service worker. Uh, while these jiashu were deemed unemployable, unemployable before the Great Leap, now they were considered uh, all of them were considered able to produce, so there's a huge, uh, drastic change uh, by the state. Without concrete plans from higher officials about what exactly to do, right? They're, now they're self-organized, but they didn't have a concrete plan from the top. These grassroots um, people um, start to experimenting with a variety of production and service work. Approximately about 240 of them began working uh, in industrial production, while the rest were put in charge of running 40 canteens and 100 care service facilities, uh, ranging from very large-scale uh, care, daycare centers uh, with hundreds of children to very small uh, ones with just a couple of children. In total, there were 100, 120 care workers offering service to about 1,500 children. And I'm going to talk about the uh, teacher and the children ratio in a moment. At the same time, the Zhengzhou Mills recruited a large number of Jiashu for work in the care service um, sectors uh, within the state-run textile mills. So before the Great Leap Forward, uh, maybe uh, people, uh, you heard people talk a lot about the uh, daycare centers um, in those uh, state-run uh, enterprises, but actually before the Great Leap Forward, at least in Zhengzhou, uh, those facilities were very much uh, underdeveloped. It's really the Great Leap Forward uh, that brought these uh, ideas into, uh, uh, like, materialized. Um, these uh, facilities established uh, during the Great Leap Forward would provide long-term uh, care and housing for uh, newborns, uh, mothers of newborns, 24-hour uh, care centers and kindergartens uh, for textile workers because they will take the night shift. So it's very essential uh, for the factory to provide uh, these uh, workers 24-7 uh, care services so that they can put their uh, babies uh, down there and they can work uh, in the uh, workshop next door, and every three or four hours uh, during the break, they can come to the nursery room next door to breastfeed. So that's a very important facility for those uh, factories. And um, then this table oops, um, shows uh, different categories of services established uh, in the factories uh, during this period. Uh, here you can just focus just on the categories. There are maternity dormitories. Again, that's a provide for moms with newborns and the 24-7 care centers and kindergartens for children older than three. And you don't have to worry about the numbers. I'll talk about the ratio just in a moment. And um, so by relocating cooking and child rearing to the collective space, the urban commune system had transgressed the public domestic boundary. Yet it was not easy to shatter the value hierarchy of productive and reproductive labor. 
Wages for these care workers depended on whether they were formal employees of the mill or jiashu, temporarily recruited from the commune. While the former, the formal employees could earn between 39 and 48 yuan per month, depending on their credential and the seniority, uh, the jiashu, the informally hired jiashu, um, would only receive about 15 to 18 uh, yuan a month. So uh, it's uh, actually a very significant difference. Moreover, while permanent employees enjoy full reimbursement for their medical bills, these jiashu could only uh, have uh, half of their medical costs uh, reimbursed. In addition, uh, jiashu consistently received fewer ration coupons uh, for food and other necessities. So they were dis at disadvantaged in every aspect. Even within the informal sector, uh, most of the jiashu would prefer employment in the workshop and learning a technical skill such as carpentry, uh, carpentry uh, than serving in the canteens or care centers. And one of them refused to join the canteen said this, um, I've been working around the stove for my whole life, no more cooking. Uh, and another one said, hasn't babysitting in the home been enough? Why are you still asking me to do that after I'm liberated uh, from my home? Um, so this hierarchical labor structure is crucial in understanding exactly how the radical regime of accumulation functioned during the Great Leap. Before the Great Leap Forward, the state was able to maintain high accumulation in the urban sector by, keep, uh, by keeping both wages and welfare redistribution low. Meanwhile, Jashu, uh, before the Great Leap, uh, were uh, doing all this unpaid um, reproductive labor uh, in the domestic sphere. Um, now, during the Great Leap, the state began tapping into the previously unproduct quote unquote, unproductive population in search of a new supply of labor. Uh, the state diverted most of the urban women into either the sphere of production or that of collectivized social reproduction. The effect of diverting Jashu to production uh, was straightforward, right? Um, you just need more women substituting men. Um, it was to boost overall labor input in production. But then the effect of diverting them from the home to the collectivized reproduct reproduction um, facilities requires some deeper, uh, consi further consideration that I'm going to walk you through uh, right now. So there are three points to consider. First, uh, of course, right, the fundamental purpose of collectivizing and concentrating domestic and care work, as Liu Shaoqi uh, told the women cadres, was not to do women a favor, but to increase the productivity of labor. However, this increased efficiency was not the result of labor-saving technology, despite some scattered experiments in food preparation. And so in the sector of food preparation, uh, they try to boost the uh, efficiency by mechanize um, some of the machines. But care work is such an interpersonal service, uh, especially child care, right? Um, it's really hard to mechanize and uh, uh, turn it into a mass production um, because it's because it's hard to mechanize or to automize, uh, to save labor and boost the efficiency in childcare, the only thing they could do, right, is to reduce the service per capita ratio. Uh, when care was based on the individual household, right, the caregiver uh, and child ratio was about one to two or one to three, right? In each family, you have uh, uh, one mom in the, right, in the social period who would typically take care of two or three children in the textile meal. But now, right, uh, if you, we go back to the charts I show you, actually the, rate, the ratio now dropped to 1 to 15 in the daycare centers and 1 to 10 in the kindergarten. That's basically how they manage to save more labor in social reproduction. That's what point one. Point two, right, since the state did not plan to subsidize these public services, communes had to resort to their own members to finance these facilities. The Zhengfangji commune asked the 50 households to give away their homes to set up canteens, so they need others to donate their space to do the canteen. It also asked each member to contribute one to three yuan to secure the startup fund, right? You have to jumpstart by paying yourself. Moreover, for the first two months, 
Jiaxu providing public services were not compensated at all, but were considered doing volunteer work. The running of these care facilities also rely on collected um, fees collected from the uh, communal members. Uh, on average, um, if you send a child to a daycare, it costs about uh, 30 yuan a month. Um, the monthly wage of a spinner or weaver back in that time was about uh, 50 yuan to 60 yuan. Uh, so that means in the late in the late 50s, um, and most families would typically have two or three children, right? So you do the math, right? Um, for instance, if you have a dual income family and your monthly income would be about 100 yuan, and sending all the three of your children to the care facility would cost um, about uh, all of your income, right? Um, so that's uh, too high, right? To, uh, to consider even feasible um, in the eyes of the parents. And the last point to consider here is the wages received by the Jiaxu now working in those public, um, con public services now uh, were at the bottom of the pay scale, appro approximately 30 yuan per month. Uh, for instance, um, in 59, there's a meal, recru they recruited 50, 53 Jiaxu to staff their newly established uh, care facilities. And this Jashu complained that um, doing childcare work was not secure, you could be removed from position at any time, you could not be eligible for union membership, that's a big deal in the social period, whether you can have the membership of the union. You don't have working years counted towards seniority, so male gongling, uh, that means you would be disqualified for pension uh, and other benefits. You don't even have an ID card. Um, so with very strong resentment from the Jashu themselves, uh, these temporary workers, uh, because they had a lot of complaints and resentment, resent, resentment and uh, some uh, concrete uh, challenges in their life, uh, some even hoarded food that should have been served to the children, as I saw in the report. Uh, even for permanent employees in the state-run meal, some of them somehow were assigned uh, jobs in those care facilities, and uh, they are better uh, positioned than the Jiaxu who are just the contemporary workers anyway. But they didn't want to uh, work in the care centers either. So young graduates, like young high school graduates uh, hope now to be assigned to those jobs, um, which to them uh, are having uh, seem to be low state have low status and no future. And due to a lack of care work staff, some women who have worked in the front line has to be forced to you know take care of the care center uh, job, even though uh, they didn't want to do that. So one person who were relocated from the front line uh, to the uh, care center uh, grumbled, uh, now my wage by working in the care center uh, is only 46 a month, which is the lowest in my workshop, uh, but the highest in the daycare. In the future, when the economy gets better, wages in the workshop would increase, but I bet that in the daycare would not. So she's really kind of uh, aware of what's going on. So taking all these um, points together, uh, as I show you, right, I hope I uh, made the case clear that here, uh, collectivization, uh, including the concentration of cooking and childcare, did not reduce families' cost of living. Instead, the opposite was true. Uh, some Jashu complained that joining the public canteen and using the care set, uh, child care service had increased their cost because all family members had to pay the canteen fee in addition to those uh, daycare fees. And uh, plus, because now they're kind of liberated from the home and uh, they were not able to breast the feeding uh, because they cannot be with their children. So they have to buy formula. That's an extra cost uh, for them. So there's a, one example of uh, Sun Yulan I found in the archive. She's also formerly a housewife. Now she's quote unquote liberated and she's 44 years old. Uh, and uh, by working in those commune based uh, uh, service uh, sector. Uh, now she could earn 24 yuan uh, in the past, right? Before the Great Leap, uh, she's a housewife. She did not earn anything. So that sounds good, right? But the problem is she has three children and each of them, by sending them to the 
pair center would cost 12. So in total is 33. <laughs> so you did the math, and uh, that's why Sun Yulan was really resentful about this um, rearrangement. And um, so in the archives, uh, I found um, they draw the conclusion conclusion that to many families like Swiss, the extra income brought in by the wage earning housewives could not offset the actual cost due to the loss of unpaid domestic labor. I, then I later realized it's still a very, very common uh, issue here in the United States today. Like you do the math and sometimes you decide not to work after you uh, have children uh, precisely because of this um, calculation. So the very quick the last stage of the story is the post leap uh, retrenchment uh, and the re-domestication of Jiaxu. Um, in June 1961, as the economic and social crisis deepened uh, because of the Great Leap, um, the Central Party shut down the, um, this urban commune uh, initiative. Uh, and quickly, I'm going to show you just one chart here. Uh, you can see um, before the Great Leap, right, right during the Great Leap, right, they, uh, this is from a textile mill factory uh, in Zhengzhou, they disproportionately recruited more women uh, into the workforce. And where did all those women come from? They were the Jiaxu, right? But in 1962, when they started the retrenchment, they started mass layoff, they disproportionately lay off more women, again, because they were Jiaxu, so they are being kind of pushed back and forth. Uh, when the state needs them, they were out, uh, out to work. They had to, out to be out to work. But when the state did not need them anymore, they were immediately pushed back right um, out of the system. Um, but they did not uh, comply that easily, right? So there are a lot of different kind of responses to the retrenchment and, um, and uh, to uh, Make it short, basically, um, some Jiaxu, uh, even though right, the jobs were lousy and uh, the cost and benefit were not that great, but uh, a great number of them, uh, after being able to work outside home, refused to be re domesticated, right? Uh, once they were out to work, they did not want to go back home despite all the uh, problems I discussed. And uh, also, many of them were pushed uh, to go to the countryside as a way uh, to um, cope with the economic hardship. And many of them refused to go back to the countryside. And in the archives, I found some of them even committed suicide as a pro uh, you know, protest, a way of protesting uh, this kind of uh, uh, radical changes. Um, so you might wonder then, what do we make of this, these uh, you know, pieces of empirical evidence I just presented you here, right? To um, uh, what should be the takeaways? To recap my argument earlier, right? I argue that women's work was not only central uh, to the formation of the regime of accumulation uh, in another or like they're not just functional, right, to the regime of accumulation. Uh, their agencies and their resistance uh, also kind of uh, derailed the Great Leap, uh, at least in the urban uh, areas. Um, so that is to say, right, gender dynamics is not just an add-on element. Uh, so we study women's experience um, just because they're important, they, they used to be marginalized, we want to just bring them to the spotlight. Not that simple, right? We study these gendered experience because that can better help us better explain, right, the uh, puzzle that can help us uh, better understand the mechanisms in political economy, right? That's the first uh, takeaway, I think. The second takeaway is that uh, I'm trying to make a intervention in this fast growing scholarship on social reproduction. Um, as I mentioned, it's a term uh, that's been used a lot these days by feminist political economists um, and uh, some uh, sociologists of labor. And uh, people are talking about under capitalism. Uh, social reproduction is something very important, right? Uh, 
uh, all the three C's, cooking, cleaning, and uh, child rearing, are so indispensable in our system. However, they are marginalized. They're kind of invisible labor, right? They're underpaid or unpaid, underappreciated. Uh, even though care work, uh, we're doing it every day. Some would argue that even teaching, right? Doing all the support work in the back. Uh, stage are all social reproductive labor, and we know right how our current system uh, are so uh, unappreciated of such work. So what's new uh, can we learn by having this socialist uh, case uh, that I just present here, right? So here are my thought, right? So I think initially when the communist uh, revolution in the 20th century uh, tried to transform our societies, they were theoretically aware of the problem of social reproduction. And the many of uh, the earlier uh, communist Soviet uh, theorists, including uh, Alexander uh, Kalantai or uh, Lenin uh, himself, were talking about how to collectivize social reproduction as a way right, to bring about gender equality and class equality. And uh, even Liu Shaoxi and the other party, Chinese party theorists, uh, were aware of this issue. Uh, however, as we have seen, they didn't manage to uh, uh, actually solve the problem, uh, if not introducing more problems. Um, so I think to the top leaders, right, as um, Liu Shaoqi, um, the problem is because to them, um, to reorganize and transform the sphere of social reproduction, right, is to um, make it turn it into a site of mass production. Here, that's the where the problem comes, right? Um, because I think it's a, rep a, a haircut is after all not a repair of a machinery, right? Uh, there's a logic, uh, a kind of a. Uh, in social rep the sphere of social reproduction, there's a gender logic and the interpersonal mechanism that can that made this sphere uh, kind of impossible to be uh, concentrated and uh, uh, mechanized in the same way that making a shoe uh, that the, in the same way that we uh, mechanize uh, shoemaking, right? I think that's um, the, the key issue here. Um, and another lesson we want to learn from this is that uh, today Zhengzhou is no longer a mill town. Uh, in the mid 2000s, after more than a decade of um, industrial uh, restructuring, all the textile mills were either sold to real uh, estate de developers or just uh, simply went bankrupt. And uh, the old uh, communi uh, textile communities uh, were really a uh, kind of a depressing uh, uh, place uh, to live in, and uh, uh, in the ruin of the um, uh, workshops, this is the uh, community that they, they live in, this the uh, housing apartments, but in the workshop they, there used to be um, the production uh, sphere, um, uh, it's all bought uh, by the real estate developers, and uh, 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 you will see, you know, fancy shopping malls and the commercial complex, uh, and a aspiring middle class uh, that uh, has, you know, become the new owner of this old place. Yet it seems that the same logic that led to the total failure of the Great Leap Forward is making a perplexing return. With the nationwide dismantling of the Danway system, private care services from in-house nannies and elderly aides to hourly domestic workers have been booming everywhere in China. Without adequate regulations and labor protections, this gray market is rife with private agencies who are profiting from the sphere of social reproduction. This time, not through labor-saving collectivization, but through direct exploitation. But I think there's a connection right, between the old regime and now. Uh, so to some extent, right, the uh, current uh, system is not a negation of state socialism, I would argue, but a continuation if you look at it from the perspective of social, of social reproduction. I actually have an article out uh, discussing uh, the current um, care service market uh, in Zhengzhou. And uh, this is all uh, I want to share with you. And uh, thank you. <laughs>